Um, and the last thing is chocolate. Uh, it's a psychoactive. Um, a lot of people might not believe that. Uh, if you've ever heard people talking about themselves as chocoholics, or thought, oh, I just really need a bar of chocolate. I'm always eating a bar of chocolate. Um, it, is, it is genuinely considered a psychoactive substance, and actually has quite a few different psychoactive ingredients all wrapped up in the same thing. Um, as does coffee, as does tea. Um, it contains stimulants. Caffeine is considered a psychoactive drug. But it's weird because it, it uh, contains psychoactives themselves, but also as it contains fat and sugar, it stimulates your body to produce its own endogenous opiate, which is basically like your own morphine. And some of its chemicals bind onto the same receptors in the brain as cannabis does. So you could almost say that it's like a very mild drug cocktail, or mixed into one. You have enough of it and high enough concentration, you do go a bit funny. I can, I can definitely tell you that. Uh, I had some at a development meeting a little while ago, I made hot chocolate on site. And um, basically, I had to stop talking for a little while because I was going to fun. It wasn't good. Um, and then literally, it was milk and really high percentage chocolate. Um, so I would say that people say, you know, that uh, controlled dose is absolutely essential. People say that we shouldn't encourage people to self-medicate because it's really dangerous. It could be hiding an underlying condition. I would argue that people are self-medicating every day. Whether they necessarily know it or not is another thing. If you take a cup of coffee because you're tired, you can take a bit of chocolate because you're feeling like you really need to you know, have a bit of a treat, you really fit, fancy it because you're feeling a bit miserable. Uh, you take some, some figs because you're feeling a bit bummed up. Those are all traditional medicine. You just don't label them because you think of them as foods that do certain things. But they're all medicine. How do you label it? Um, also, okay, you see those things, walk past, that's your image of a synthetic pharmaceutical drug. Um, Carl Perman, it's used to treat IBS. It's very, very, very widely available, putting it in boots in some hospital. Um, and all it is is basically mint oil, peppermint oil, in a gelatin capsule. The other way to get your hands on peppermint oil is to put, put some leaves in a cup of boiling water. And uh, it's a, not equally, uh, equally effective, but it's definitely a way of getting hold of the same active ingredient. Um, preparation H, and I promise you that Preparation H, its formula changes from country to country. In this country, its only active ingredient is witch hazel. In a lot of countries, it contains witch hazel and synthetics. This country, it's active, it's just that. Basically, boil some witch hazel leaves and twigs up, you, you get some water, add a little bit of a thickener, which is usually, and I think in Preparation H, it also comes from seaweed, so another natural occurring compound to make it thick and gel-like. That's all it is. Um, and Zostrix, I don't know if that's available in the UK actually, but it's very, very popular around the world. It's um, used to treat muscle strain, sprain, um, bits and pieces like that. Basically, it's active ingredient, it's capsaicin, it's what, make, what makes some um, chilies taste spicy. Um, it also, as chilies create pain, they can also produce pain in a really weird, ironic way. Uh, basically, heat some chilies in oil and add a bit of thickener, and you've got Zostrix. Um, so I would argue that whether you know it or not, in medicine form or in food form, we're medicating all the time and to a lesser or greater extent, sometimes effectively. So I would say that um, the, the question should be, is herbal med medicine relevant today? It's just about, do we know that it's relevant today? Because we do it all the time. Um, and it's pretty, pretty effective in lots of circumstances. Not every single one, as I suggested, you know, with, with uh, uh, pomegranate juice and goji berries. But there is a lot of evidence for some of that. Um, and I thought it ended there. If you have any questions, feel free to file them on over. I think a lot of people may misinterpret those as medical terms. So we put that in just in case someone was to misinterpret what we were saying. So quite clearly, any scientist is going to know that they're not clinical trials, but some people could think that we were saying So I often say, of course these aren't clinical trials, or of course these aren't clinical trials. I try and vary. Um, but I think it was very high up in um, the production of BBC's mind that this should be a series that's utterly responsible from beginning to end, and utterly bulletproof in terms of, sort of bad science criticism. And I think we did, we did a relatively good job. I mean, the program was a lot less about herbalism than it was about pharmacy. We just happened to use plants. It's all its rationalization, all its intellectual underpinning was basically, these are drugs, this is how you administer them, they contain these chemicals that do this, and that's been demonstrated or suggested at least in certain charts. Um, we didn't go down the hardcore herbalism route for exactly that issue. Um, I think that herbalism is so surrounded by so many stereotypes that it's really unuseful to convincing people to go out there and do it for themselves. That whole kind of muddy boots, 
cauldron, shamans in the Amazon kind of idea. I think we wanted to show that, you know, this isn't dusty, you know, this is relevant, it's practical, you can do it at home. And in many cases, that's lots of work. It's not every case. No, they just go Um, I've grown up using Annua up on Dartmoor yeah. very successfully. Um, got it analysed and it had the anti-malarial compounds in it. Um, we're looking at global warming, increasing a lot of temperatures and knocking out a lot of habitats. Um, so, two questions. Um, one is, if we're looking ahead, what should we be starting to grow now? And that we be, could be teaching our children and teaching our own um, culture to start using on an ordinary level. The other thing is, is that you would never use the artemisium in, um, or the artemisia on its own in Chinese herbal medicine. You always have it as a, a, a mixture of plants. And I think we have a bit of a mistaken thinking about plants being magic bullets in the same way that the drugs are magic bullets. So also, how do we start to think about developing a more complex, more knowledge-based, ordinary use of, of, of plants as our everyday medicines. I think that's a really good point about the reductionist thing I mentioned earlier, where you can think about one plant containing one substance and that will work. Um, I think traditionally the idea is that uh, traditional practitioners mix things basically with greater or less efficacy to, put, to not put all their eggs in one basket. And that's very often the case like when I'm in for I put everything I know and it will do something and with the hope of one little stick. Lots of different things that attack the sort of thing from all angles or all different symptoms of the same condition. Um, but I think that that's quite an outmoded type of um, take on, on pharmacy. I think uh, professors of pharmacy, particularly the one we worked on in this series, who was one of the, the best in the country at the University of Reading, um, is quite open and aware that that's what would have happened in the past, but the more we're discovering now, the more we're realizing there are synergies. Let's say. There are synergies, there are relationships which are synergetic between, uh, between certain medicines, and it's not necessarily a case of putting lots of blocks together that don't interact with them. Sometimes, like in the case of ayahuasca, it's two things that react together that create one compound, rather than just one thing working at the same time. Um, in terms of climate change, uh, I, think, I think it's brilliant. I'm particularly uh, have a, a bit of a penchant for exotic, unusual things you can do in this country. Um, and I think that it's, it's all about risk, isn't it? It's um, mitigating risk and testing out lots of things. Uh, there's parts of climate change is mitigation, basically trying to stop it happening. And the other half is adaptation. We know it's going to happen. What can we do to prevent or what can we do to make the best of the new situation? And um, I think that uh, medicinal plants are just one of those crops that we can test out and diversify with.